everybody. Welcome back to another episode of What a Hell of a Way to Die. Nate and Francis are back. We are back from our respective trips and doings and things going on. Uh, Nate had a much better time than I did. Uh, Nate, how are things going back in the, uh, the sunny land of England? Well, I mean, sunny is obviously a bit of a generous statement. Uh, things are things are fine. I'm uh, I got back last night. Uh, was in was in France actually. I took the. It had always been a lifelong dream of mine since I was a small kid to take the Euro Tunnel, the the, the tunnel under the English Channel, which has been open since the since 1994, but uh, was not open in time before I my family moved back to America when I lived in Germany as a kid. So did that. It was so, it was so hilariously unremarkable on the way down that I didn't even really notice it had happened until I was like, "Wow, we've been we've been in the dark for a while." Uh, I guess we're we're we must be under the English Channel, and then then we popped out, and I was like, "Oh, cars are driving on the opposite side of the roads, and the fence around the train tracks looks like something out of like the worst fob in Iraq. Like it's just super brightly lit and like triple strand concertina everywhere." I'm like, "Oh yeah, we're 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 in Calais now." Um, but it was good, you know. It was a nice, nice little vacation, and, and I'm back. Uh, I'm back in London, back in the rainy island, full of full of turfs and morons, and uh, I'm excited to uh, to start another week of podcasting. Was well, that is that not called the Channel anymore, or was it ever called the Channel? I feel like that's what I, I think always the knew Channel it is like Brexit in the sense that it's sort of like a neologism that just got adapt adapted into like common speak for a while. But it's it, I think its actual name is the Channel Tunnel. Uh, the, cha- the Euro well, yeah, Tunnel, the if I'm tunnel, not mistaken, channel. yeah, Channel for Channel Tunnel, yeah, yeah. I think the I think the Euro Tunnel is the um is the name of the train service that provides where you drive your car basically into a train car and then they you know you drive under that that's like it's like a ferry transport um, because they do that as well. Besides passenger trains, there's also like car trains where you can't drive your own car, but um you know you drive onto a train car and then you get in like a passenger cab and they drive you across to the French side. Mm. Um, and that's called Euro Tunnel. Like you see the branding for that. So I think Elon uh, Musk he, had an idea for that, where it was a whole thing, and then it was just like, well, you just drive your car in a tunnel, I guess. And it was yeah, like, exactly. Yeah, uh, man, uh, that's famously what we a thing said. that <laughs> uh, famously a thing that that is going to be safe and faster and, and good for the environment. Yeah, it was weird. I was actually reading about this, so I was like, wow, because the TGV in France, like the the high speed trains are awesome, and Britain doesn't really have high speed train trains in the same way that continental Europe does. In that. For example, the only stretch of British railway that actually meets the standard of being a high-speed rail network is the connection from London to the Euro Tunnel or to the Channel Tunnel. So basically anywhere else in the country is not as fast, but the trains in France are super fast. And the funny thing was reading up on this, I didn't realize this, but apparently when they started developing the TGV in France in the late 60s and early 70s, they actually wanted to make it have an airplane jet engine on the train. So it was going to be like a fucking, like a, like a jet engine attached that that was on the train engine that was going to be tearing ass hauling down the train tracks. And it wasn't the loud noise or the fuel consumption or or just the insanity of such a project that canceled. It was actually uh, the 1973 oil crisis uh, caused them to be like, yeah, this may not work. And they had to kind of re-engineer the thing to be electric. Uh, but yeah, there was a time in which they wanted to have a jet engine train, like something out of like a weird steampunk anime that was going to be just like ripping across France, just polluting the shit out of things and sucking birds into the engines. It would have been amazing. That that is some fucking uh, some Spider Man villain shit. Just like put a put a fucking jet engine on it, whatever. Like that's, that's I think that's what it's like, like everybody, Snowpiercer with wine, basically. Right. That that was like how they did everything in the 1950s. It's like I put put an <laughs> atomic slug in it and put a jet engine on it and uh, and and fuck it. Then we've got we've got an economy going on. Hell yeah, man! I'm excited for it. How are you though? You were you were recently struck by illness. You had a Victorian wasting disease that confined you to your bed. Good lord! So I went on my fa- my final annual training, and I was actually kind of excited about it because it was going to be we had nice you know barracks to stay in, and we we're in Fort Riley, so it wasn't like the weather wasn't too bad. And I ended up, yeah, oh, we also took all of our big guns out. Like we took our 50 caliber machine guns, our 240 Bravos. And they're like, we're going to shoot all this shit off. We got ammo for it and everything. So I was very excited to do all of that. And then, uh, yeah, like on Wednesday, I started, we were, we were having a range day. We were qualifying on the M4s. And I was like, mm, I don't feel great. You know, I was like, I got a bit of a bubbly stomach. Uh, and, uh, of course the toilets were fucking quarter mile away. So every time I needed shit, I had to go and make that fucking trudge. 
and uh, it just kept getting worse. And uh, my the stomach bug that I thought that I had turned out to be, uh, well, I mean, it was a stomach bug. It was just not a 24-hour stomach bug. And literally for seven days, I was unable to operate. Um, I was hospitalized for a little bit because I was so horribly dehydrated uh, because I couldn't keep anything down or keep anything in. And yeah, and when I was in there, the doctor was just like, sorry, man, there's really nothing we can do. We'll give you two bags of saline and a little something for your nausea, but it's a virus, so there's nothing we can do. Um, well, that sucks. Sorry to hear it, man. Fuck. Yeah, it remi- but it's your last AT, though. Yeah. It reminded me of uh, when I had dysentery, and I was just like, can't you just give me Cipro? Because they did that, and I was perfectly happy and fine afterwards. They're like, well, you don't have dysentery. You have a virus. So there's like literally nothing you can do about a virus. Um, you just have to treat the symptoms and wait for the body to fight it off. So, But yeah, last uh, last annual training. Next, next summer, my unit is deploying, and I am not going with them because I have not signed a new contract, nor am I going to sign a new contract. So this is... Because you're retiring, right? Yeah. July... 23rd i go into my last year uh and uh then it's just the the downward slide into uh i'm gonna in october hopefully gonna do my last pt test and uh after that just uh just go ahead and get fat and uh fat and grow well fatter and grosser than i am though i have to catch up because i ended up losing 15 pounds with this wasting disease so uh i gotta i'm i'm Below, I'm below 185, so I got to catch back up and start drinking beer and eating pizza again. Speaking, Damn, son. Speaking of Nate, let's talk about some changes about the, the military. Now, you and I have been in the army together, uh, you know, for for a good chunk of time. We've seen a lot of changes, a lot of different things that have been uh, that have been moving around. I got a, uh, a pair of stories that uh, that we're taking a look at. That, uh, that have to do a lot with, with, with changes in the military. Now, I don't know what it is about, you know, like every couple of years. I think what happens is like a general changes somewhere, like somewhere uh, uh, a two-star, a three-star, or a four-star changes, right? And so everybody's got to change everything else. Um, we got to make a bunch of different fucking stupid changes in the army so that this general or whatever can feel good about themselves this happens all the time when i was in iraq first id came in uh they saw all of the you know the stuff that the 34th id had up like little red bull symbols they like literally sent um a a fucking team of privates with an nco around to like spray paint over and like eradicate the memory of the 34th infantry division and put up big red ones everywhere so it's you know, the, the the military, you know, if anything, loves to take something that seems to be working and change it because fucking what else? Or take things that aren't working and changing it. Sometimes they do try to try to make things better, but not always. Um, so we have one story here about uh, recruitment for the infantry. Um, now, Nate, you were infantry, right? I was. You're an expert in infantry. That's correct. So, <laughs> well, I wouldn't go that far, but I was, <laughs> I was an infantry officer and I was a graduate of both the infantry officer basic and advanced course and ranger school. So, I mean, I did some, I, I carried some rucksacks on my back. Yes. Look, there's, you have paperwork that says you're an expert of being in the infantry. So, mm-hmm. so what do what do we need to do, Nate, to bring more people in the infantry? Cause the army has some ideas, but before we get to the army's ideas, what are, what, what are your ideas? How do we recruit people? And I mean, yes, you know, stop doing forever war. Like we know, we know the actual answer, but like, you know, if you had to like recruit some, if you had to convince somebody to join the infantry, what do you think that we should be, what, what should we be doing? here? Playing up the challenging nature of it. The fact that the job, the job is hard. The fact that, you are absolutely doing, you are being a soldier in the sense of you're the, you're on the front line, whether that's a good or bad thing. I mean, it's weird to say like, okay, how do you recruit people to something that's right now being used to, uh, for very, very bad ends, we'll put it that way. But I think the appeal of the infantry is that it's challenging. I think that the reason people want to be infantry, well, if they do want to be infantry and they didn't just get classed infantry because their ASVAB sucked, uh, I think it's that it's hard. And I think... For me, at least, when I think about how to make people want to go infantry and stay infantry, I think you've got to play up the physical challenge, the endurance involved, the fact that it's a 
it's a very important skill set for a soldier. You know, you you learn how to do soldiering things. You know, if you're in, you envision yourself as a soldier, then the idea of knowing how to I don't know, knowing field craft, knowing how to pack a ruck, knowing how to, you know, camp in the woods, basically like move at a moment's notice, knowing how to do weapons maintenance, how to maintain, how to you know, keep your weapons up, how to do all those things, how to engage with all the weapon systems, whether it's, you know, your, your individual rifles, whether it's a light machine gun, a medium machine gun, a heavy machine gun, an automated grenade launcher, uh, an individual grenade launcher, a hand grenade, an anti-tank rocket, all these things you have to know these skills and they're challenging and it's actually like it actually matters you know it's not just shooting you know at a vr screen and like the fucking whatever they call those things i've forgotten but you know like the compressed air thing the 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 simulator range the est you know, yeah i ran EST. one of the I yeah, ran, yeah yeah I ran, yeah a, I ran an est while we were on a, uh, annual training that was fun I guess that's the way that if you want to sell the infantry to people, you have to sell the fact that it's hard and that it's going to be a physical and mental challenge. Uh, I think the one of the problems that you encounter is that the the actual life of the infantry is plenty of mental and physical challenges, but not in a good way. Um, it's just the training, the routine, et cetera, it, it, the the conditions. You all you always. You have only the pride of being an infantryman to fall back on when you realize that basically everyone else has like this weird self-actualizing life-affirming experience if they're in a combat service support role. They're like NCOs who want you to like get your college credits and get a fucking master's degree online while you're in the military versus in the infantry where they're just like, why are you not fucking sucking shit hard enough? Like it's just, it's a very different experience. Yeah, the for for me, I always like when I was joining and I was looking at the infantry. My brother, my brother, when he joined in the eighties, he was infantry, and my dad was the infantry back in the day. And I was like, I don't know, maybe I should do maybe infantry, right? Because like it is the you know when you think about like the manly thing uh, that you do in the military, it is the infantry um, because, like you said, it's the hard thing to do. It's the rough and tumble thing and the thing is i think it bears mention that like that that we you say manly but like i mean women can be in the infantry too it's just tough like whether you whether you want to code that as being like a like a masculine thing or not the the fact of the matter is you carry heavy stuff on your back you walk a long way you have to live in austere conditions it sucks and 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 that challenge is embedded in it and so there's an appeal to it whether you know no, no, no matter what your gender no matter what uh you, you know your 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 physical profile it's a hard task to take on sure it's challenging and when i was like in 18 19 i was like man i bet i bet i could do that and the thing that, that my brother told me he's just like yeah it's really you know it's, there's a real sense of satisfaction afterwards but after you get through basic training you're still in the infantry for like a couple of years so rethink that because, yeah, I mean, I think about if like, I had enlisted the, at 18, I would have just, I probably would have enlisted to be like a fucking linguist or something. Like, it's weird how uh, exposure to it made me want to be an infantry officer because I liked the training. I liked what we were doing. But uh, in my heart, I think if you had asked me as a high school student, I would like, I want to go to DLI and learn Arabic. And they would have sent me and I probably would have gone and been a fucking huge anime weeaboo. <laughs> now look even in the inf- most of the anime weeaboos that i've met have been infantry one fucking uh trip to korea or japan and fucking a quarter of infantry people come back screaming that hentai is art so i'm just saying that if you dli has an unbelievable reputation in the army as being where nerds weebs and furries hang out in uniform it is so full of weirdos, and I mean, and, and 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 I've heard this from multiple people, to include people who I know who've gone through DLI. It's full of weirdos, and so it's just hilarious because, like, you know, when you get on, um, I can't even remember the name of the army portal. What, what's what's the website called? Like the the army portal? AKO the Army Knowledge AKO, Online. AKO Army Knowledge yeah. Online. You know how AKO would have like the front page photos that would just be taken from somewhere, some PAO had taken a photo. Yeah. Yeah, well, there was one. It was a bunch of Chinese students at DLI doing Tai Chi with their instructor, and they were all like dressed up in what I might describe as as they were like in kung fu robes. And I was just like, and this is their army PT, and I was just like, wow, that's an entirely different military experience, of course. Um, and yeah, maybe I shouldn't rag on them too much. Long story short, 
if I had joined, I think if I, what would have been, uh, I knew about the DLI when I was, um, when I was in high school, cause my parents talked about it a bunch. I think that if I had been recruited as a high school student, that's probably what I would have done. I would have, I would have classed to like some, you know, 35 series linguist, whatever, and, uh, and gone and, and, and studied a language. Um, but instead I went to college and I thought the army will need me to have Arabic as an officer. They'll definitely care. And then like, <laughs> they didn't give a fuck, you know, the army, which will famously assign like native Farsi and Arabic speakers instead of in- Intel. They'll be like, no, you can't get a security clearance. Go be a cook or a, cu- a truck driver instead. Um, yeah, they didn't give a shit. I like how you went to uh, to college and managed to get the dumber job after, rather than if you had gone enlisted. I had a well, buddy. I mean, to be fair, being an infantry officer is really competitive because it, it's it, it's um, for people who want to be career officers. Um, it's the choice because it's just you're, there's so much, so many more infantry positions that the promotion track is there. Like it's easier to get command uh, as an infantry officer, and then you know if you look at the people who wind up getting in, promoted into senior positions in the army, they tend to be infantry or at least combat arms. Mm. Yeah, I. Uh... You should have just been a reservist, man. They they recruit the or they uh they promote the shit out of all of us. So, um, but you know, again, like we said, there's there's honor and glory to be won uh in the infantry. However, Nate, nobody's joining the infantry. Nobody's joining the army in general. Um, so the the military is taking upon themselves to good idea ferry themselves into a how do we. How do we get more people? How do we get more specifically infantry? Um, Because to be fair, most of the war fighting kind of comes down on the infantry, even though I have barely like I know everybody's got different experiences at war. I've been to war twice. I have very rarely run into actual infantry soldiers my times in war. And like I don't I'm not a fob it like I've spent a lot of time uh, on forward operating bases and provincial reconstruction teams. And I've been around a lot of MPs, um, a lot of ADA uh, tankers at one point, but never really have I been sitting around with a bunch of actual 11 Bravos, um, you know, in, in these combat scenarios. And, you know, I didn't really do foot patrols and I did, you know, this is not to say I didn't, I'm just saying that I ran into a lot more people other than infantry than, than actual infantry while I was, uh, while I was there. Um, I don't know if they fucking squirreled you guys away somewhere to keep it, keep you, keep the rest of the population pure and holy away from you, uh, fucking grunts, but you know, who, who knows, but we've got some radical ideas to, uh, to kind of change things from, from military.com here, uh, including a quarter million dollar bonuses and, uh, no grunts under the age of 26. Uh, and I guess that means no recruiting anybody over the age of 26 to become, uh, uh, infantry, which uh, is a is a curious age because it's like right when you age off of your parents' uh, health insurance. <laughs> <laughs> yes, brilliant. They figured it out. <laughs> I mean, I was thinking about this that the people who, I mean, realistically speaking, if you decide that you want to join the military and you want to go combat arms at twenty six, like it's not, um, it's probably not going to be a decision you're taking lightly, or you're you know you're frustrated with the the, the great big vacuous suck that is the civilian world, but. I also think that part of me envisions this being uh, they want people who are going to be mature, but but also not so mature that they're too old for the training. Um, although it's funny because, I mean, I, I, I don't think I think 26 is probably has more to do with the insurance age, like you said, than than any sort of like milestone in which a person suddenly becomes more mature that the they were talking about trying to have a base salary of you know sixty thousand dollars and quarter million dollar bonuses um the quarter million dollar bonus thing sounds i mean that sounds like something they would give you for you know a huge enlistment package like signing up for a really long time that's what they um, give, as far as i know Nate, that's what they ahead, give, sorry that's what they give pilots and then not not even that much a lot of times like they give pilots you know 150 hundred thousand dollars depending on what you fly but those are pilots. Like we, yeah. We, I mean, I've heard of guys in, in special forces getting uh, reenlistment bonuses, like when they're E sevens and they're getting ready to go t- um, indefinite. Their last reenlistment as you know an E, e- senior E six or E seven um, guys who were you know SF SF qualified and 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 multiple. Uh, skill identifiers things like you know halo halo jump master combat dive etc i uh demo things along those lines 
I've heard of people, you know, getting bonuses, you know, in, in like the $100,000 range. And obviously, like the thing that people always try to do is to time those reenlistments so that they can reenlist while they're deployed so that they can basically the first, I don't know, like $105,000 of their income that year is non-taxable. Um, but I've never heard of a quarter million dollars. I mean, I wouldn't, like you said, I wouldn't be surprised if that's what the, the Air Force pays pilots because the Air Force has been fighting really hard to keep pilots in because pilots realize they can get out of the Air Force and have much more of a semblance of a normal life in civilian aviation than in the Air Force where they both have to fly a fuckload and also, you know, be subject to like, oh, it's Saturday and we're going to get yelled at because a 19-year-old got drunk and, you know, broke curfew or fucking got a DUI or something, which all the problems the civilian world notwithstanding, those that doesn't happen. I've never had my job yell at me because somebody else in the company got in trouble. Um, so, I mean, it, to me at least, they were offering huge bonuses to people in like 06, 07 to enlist, specifically to enlist combat arms and to go to airborne school. I mean, not in those, not like, you know, $100,000, $200,000, but, you know, I, I had soldiers who got bonuses in the forty dollars to $50,000 range to enlist. Uh, and I think that was, that was common. They were, uh, for the first time that I was aware of, they were offering officers cash bonuses to stay in. I remember guys in year group uh, 05, I believe. Um, so these were people who commissioned in 05 as officers and then, you know, would have been getting out, would have been looking to potentially get out in and around the 2009, 2010 timeframe. Um, in, I want to say about 07 or 08. So maybe it was earlier a year groups. I'm not sure. There were guys who were getting offered $35,000 uh, as officers to stay in, which is really rare. I've never, that was the only time I'd ever heard of officer cash bonuses. I mean, like you said, maybe for pilots or like super skilled professions, that might be the case. But as like an infantry officer, them offering you 35 grand to stay in uh, was, uh, that was, that was unusual. But that was because the problem they were facing was that people who commissioned, you know, in 03, 04, 05, uh, had gone through not just mul- probably at that point, at least one, if not multiple deployments, but also just seeing the war get shittier and shittier and dwell times get less and less. And what I mean by dwell time is like the amount of time you get to stay in your, you know, on where you're based I- I- stateside and not have to deploy again, that was getting reduced. So a lot of people were getting out and they realized that they had built this timeline, this pipeline of what they assumed, you know, would be their personnel reserves. And all of a sudden they were facing this massive dent in those numbers because people were getting out because it fucking sucked, you know? And it's like, why would you want to stay in if it sucked that bad? I mean, some people want to, don't get me wrong, but I mean, even, even, even the hardest of hard men get broken after a long enough timeline. And the army had, you know, an inexhaustible supply of horrible experiences for you to take on. So... They they started offering cash bonuses. I, I I mean this to me though this this and I went read that Military Times piece that you sent, which we'll link in the show notes. A lot of that just kind of seems like policy papers of different defense think tanks just yelling at each other. Like none of this seems to really have any bearing in in what I perceive as the DoD's actual plan moving forward. Does that make sense? Oh yeah, the, these are all this is all good idea fairy stuff. You know, this is a bunch of people sat around like you said, and they're like, let's you know brainstorm and throw stuff to a wall and see what sticks. And then uh, somebody found like the big butcher block that they wrote all these, you know, 20, you know, 250 K question mark, question mark, question mark, you know, and then they made a story out of it. But like, you know, this is you know very indicative of just kind of how the military, you know, does this. They come up with these like outlandish ideas um, to, to fix to fix a problem, which like you could pay me and Nate, you know, five dollars a month. And you can hear us <laughs> fix every problem in the military. We and- will solve your military problems. <laughs> yeah. Get one, get one Lieutenant General. Get Lieutenant General uh, Lucky, the reserve, the reserve uh, guy. Um, have him listen to it. Have him listen to me bitch about the reserves. And $5 a month. You know, I know that like all the good stuff is free and uh, all the, the movie reviews are behind the paywall. But, you know, hey, they're, they're good movie reviews. Uh, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll fix everything. We're, we're here to, to tell you, you know, the easiest way to do this is, you know, if you want to retain people, stop doing a shitty war forever. Um, very, very simple. Uh, and I know that we're kind of, uh, I know how much you keep up with it. Um, but we are in peace talks with the, the Taliban. And of course there's, you know, kind of a, a back and forth with that because there's, 
uh, you know, they're like, okay, cool, you guys are going to leave. And we're like, well, we're not going to leave. And they're like, well, this isn't really a peace negotiation then if you're not going to get the fuck out of here. And to be fair, I agree with the Taliban on that one. But that's neither here nor there. Uh, I, it's the military, like I said, likes to change things. They like to throw shit to the wall and see what sticks and, uh, whatever sticks is usually somewhat of a good idea that they're going to fucking twist them to being a dumb shitty idea. And in the end, then you've got people having to do deadlifts for a PT test and everybody's going to get snapped in half. So but what do I know? I'm getting the fuck out. So I don't care anymore. Um, the army can be massive fuck ups all they want from now on. Francis is going to have army senioritis. I, I know I know exactly how that feels, dude. I remember. So my last month in the army, I had to do um, a, what's it called? The 15-6 investigation because of incorrect ammo disposal that had been done during training in Korea. And obviously, like, I did my job and I came to the conclusion I needed to come to. But my God, you can imagine me being like, um, yes, I'll do this investigation. but." Uh, I'm also leaving the army for good in like three weeks. So uh, this is kind of like you assigning me a big science fair project like three weeks before I graduate high school. But, you know, whatever. It is what it is. It happened. Um, look, man, I, I, I agree with you. I think that one of the weird things about my experience in the military, and I think the last 20 years has been Sometimes things are deliberated to a great degree to the point where they seek consensus immeasurably, but those seem to be like what you might describe as culture war flashpoints. For example, consider how much they consulted on the policies before they determined that they could repeal Don't Ask, Don't Tell and that gay people could serve openly. Consider the lengths they've gone to to simply create a kind of like official stamp of review to just certify what military psychologists have been saying over and over again, which is that trans service members aren't in, in any way a threat to good order and discipline. They, they deliberate the shit out of that. But then other things specifically with regard to procurement or equipment testing or you know training norms will sometimes seem as though they're rushed through in ways that almost boggle the mind because they have massive far-reaching effects for soldiers you know things like the molly rucksack just kind of getting dropped on us things like the acu combat pattern things like the first strike ration um the extent to which iraq and afghanistan were basically testing grounds for different models of mraps things like that that'll happen very quickly uh when th th it's determined that there's a need and sometimes you wind up kind of bearing the brunt, bearing the burden of weird, rushed, or siloed decision making. And this new PT test, like I think, is going to be a disaster. But like you, I am so out of the army, it's not even funny. Uh, I'm not even on IRR anymore. I'm completely out. I have my honorable discharge. I don't even live in America, so I don't even fucking try to draft my ass. Like, it, it, I'm done with it. And so it's weird to watch it from afar. But there's another part of me that wonders, like, you know, at some point, it, some poor private has to put up with this shit. You know, some poor private has to, in my case, <laughs> you know, you're on a, you're on a mission driving around in an MRAP and your Harris radio dumps its fill and you have to refill it or you have to reset a frequency because something's gone wrong and you need to change net. And you realize that the way that that MRAP is built, there's no way for you when wearing body armor to turn around in your vehicle as the, as the vehicle commander and change that radio. You, you, there won't be enough physical room for you to do that. So one of two things can happen. Either someone in the back of the truck can, can crawl through and unhook your radio and hand it to you so you can do it, or you have to open the, the door, which is you know meant to prevent blasts and bullets from killing you, and hang your fucking ass out the side of this truck trying to fix your radio because the design is bad. You know That's something that I experienced personally, but think about I don't know how many people uh, found themselves in disadvantage, disadvantageous situations in firefights because their camo print sucked. And it's just literally like, it looks like you're fighting in a broken TV. You know, how many people ha are going to deal with orthopedic injuries that might, you know, foreclose or preclude their military careers because of injuries, because, you know, the army decided that it's going to make everybody into a CrossFitter. 
Like there, these are a lot of things that you, on one hand, it's, it's funny and it's dumb and it's absurd. And you're just like, this is insane, but it's also hilarious. But on the other hand, it's like young privates are the ones who wind up bearing the, the absolute worst burden of this because they have zero say in what happens to them. And, you know, the army will just, just as they'll, when they throw you out of a plane in a parachute, like you, you have to, to trust that everything's been done right. Because you don't, you don't know, and you have no control. And at that point, you can't really be a jump refusal, you know, uh, unless something is really wrong with your gear. And so, it's the same thing. I, 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 on one hand, I laugh, on the other, I just feel bad because, you know, much like one of the other stories we were talking about with, uh, with them deciding that they want to, you know, some, 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 so, some soft, cool guys decided that uh, you gotta, you know, make everybody go on the keto diet. Um, these things are just good idea fairies, like you said, but but they have real world effects. Yeah, that, and and that kind of leads into the other story in which uh, soldiers are fat, and now we're trying to do something where we uh, one of the ideas was to put everybody um, onto a keto diet. So so yeah, we've got the weird CrossFit thing that we're trying to do, which like I don't know I don't know who owns a CrossFit box that they're trying to make every every troop join or whatever. We have a CrossFitter in our in our unit. And, you know, not going to lie, she's in great shape uh, and she loves to do CrossFit and I don't have anything against CrossFit um, if that's what you want to do and that's what keeps you active and, you know, um, uh, working out. Fantastic. Thumbs up to you. I don't want to do CrossFit uh, ever, Mm -hmm. ever. I don't Mm want to do CrossFit. Me neither. Um, You know, and it's not just the weird kipping videos. It's just like, it's just the thing that I don't want to do. I don't, I like to walk my dog. I like to lift weights. Uh, I like to do yoga. Those are my things that I enjoy doing. Um, and in the army, you know, before b- before we moved over to PRT, the army PT that we did was kind of dumb. And um, but I, I don't know, like you could we stretched and we had some things that we did. Uh, you know, you had your your uh, buddy workouts. You had um, you know, you did what did you do? You did push ups. You did sit ups. You ran. Like why? Because that's the shit that you do on the PT test. Um, I think that what we do now is better. I think PRT was a good idea. Um, I have been broken off by PRT before, uh, especially if you don't do it very often. It works a lot of muscles. It's like PRT is one of those things that I've always been like, this was planned decently. And But the problem is that PRT does not prepare you for a PT test. Um, if you really, if you want to do a 300 on the PT test after PRT, you better just be doing a shitload of push-ups and sit-ups and going out and running on your own. Um, you know, PRT doesn't do that for you. So I don't know about this new PT test, uh, where, where that's going to, uh, what PRT is going to do for you there. Probably nothing. Um, again, there's deadlifts in it for some fucking reason. I don't know if that's going to stick around or, or what, but certainly because some fucking soft dude who like worships an oak tree is his goddamn, you know, designated religion on his fucking personal statement. Like he thinks deadlifts is how you determine a warrior's true worth or some shit. And that person has enough enough say in the process. They've decided that deadlift is what it is. You know, that's that's how we're going to assess soldiers when deadlifts. Great workout. Don't get me wrong. Work a lot of muscles. But if you do them badly, you can really fuck up your back. And like. I'm I'm gonna be the first to tell you, I have had lingering back problems from when I was in the army, and I mean I've found a sort of physical therapy solution that works for me. But there were years when I literally couldn't run because of my lower back pain, and I love running, and it fucking sucked to not be able to run, but I couldn't because I, I couldn't sit down or sleep afterwards if I if I did like because my lower back was so messed up. Um, and I don't think deadlifting did. I mean I did deadlift to some extent, but but always you know with with experienced people with me and also I, I didn't make it like my big thing but i mean back injuries are hugely problematic for people and i don't know i just when i think about the kind of bad pt we did in the army where it's like go outside in the cold and just start running with no stretching and no real warm-up that kind of thing you know i i think about wh- how much worse it can be when you start adding in more than body weight yeah, yeah, it's it, it it's not great, and it's not like true deadlifts. It's the little diamond. It's the cage deadlifts, but it still is not great. Um, so, but this key this keto diet thing is funny to me because they're basically saying, okay, well, we tested this on a bunch of of college athletes. We tested this on a bunch of ROTC cadets. We've decided that this this works. You know, people their performance is better, and for Navy SEALs, like they can stay underwater longer if they're on if they're in ketosis because you know it it it, it improves their their ability to breathe. But I, correct me if I'm wrong here, but 
it, it seems as though what they're trying to say is if you can force all soldiers into ketosis, then they're going to perform really well. But this article makes it sound like there, this would be a thing that they could do, you know, army wide or, you know, for combat arms or something along those lines. When the article itself sounds like adopting it into any kind of DOD, you know, dining facility thing is really going to be relegated to like special units. Because I just, the idea of trying to, like, can you imagine, Francis, after all the fucking (laughs) dad shit you have to do to your soldiers, all the stupid shit you have to check them for, you know, the number of times I've had to be like, all right, uh, Sergeant X, please take this soldier to the shower and watch him shower and soap himself because he's disgusting. Can you imagine me like, no, I have to go make my fucking soldiers eat their vegetables. Like, I have to make them eat mashed cauliflower and not bread. Like... (laughs) Yeah, can I, you imagine? And and the thing the thing that kills me about keto is keto requires you to eat keto and that's it. No beer, no pizza, no no alcohol. Yeah, no okay, it's the weekend. I'm going to have, you know, a There fucking, are no there are no cheat meals. Yeah, like, no burgers and brats because as soon as you break ke- ketosis, as soon as you break your keto diet, you have to get back onto it and your body because it's a it's a basically putting your body into a state of ketosis in which it's burning your fat rather than burning carbohydrates. So you're basically eating, you know, lean meat and protein and vegetables, um, no real grains, no bread or anything like that. And that's it. And 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 probably no cheese. And yeah, no alcohol, none of this stuff. Imagine ever telling soldiers you can't drink and not just for like, you can't drink for this exercise where we're going to be out for a week. You can't drink for this deployment. You can't drink ever, ever. Like who's going to fucking control that? Like this is, this is one of those things that I just don't like, I don't understand why somebody's like, what about keto? And then anybody who knows fucking anything about keto who like, and tr- what I learned about keto was from this article. So I already know this is a stupid idea because I did the five seconds to read the article. It's just like, there's no way, there's no way you are getting soldiers to do this. Like, and because the soldiers don't give a fuck. Like the army sucks, man. The army fucking sucks. And one of the few things that you get in this, in this man's army is food and booze. And that's it. And, like, now they're trying to fucking take that away. Like, they want to take smoking away, which, honestly, I understand. I don't think that that's going to work. Uh, I don't think that, you know, making army bases go completely smoke-free is uh, is going to do much for, for anything other than make soldiers fucking... I think some people would quit. But, you know, I, o- overall, I, I don't think that you're, that you're going to do much with that. But, like, also, I just don't feel like... I don't, I don't understand why anybody would try to take away, like... The one, like the last vestiges of of what makes any soldier somewhat happy, is to be like, you can't do this now. Like, and they're testing this with like special forces soldiers who are like probably, um, I would imagine, the most like healthy people ever because that's all they do is exercise and fucking lift weights or go running or do all this shit. At least all the special forces dudes I knew uh, did that shit. So, so now we're trying to make them go. To, to do, do this keto diet and it's like I don't I can't I just can't imagine I can't imagine taking it away from anybody and just being like being a soldier fucking sucks like even even when you when you're all fucking jacked up on on motivation and stars and stripes and fucking saluting a blue lives matter flag or whatever the fuck at the end of the day being a soldier fucking sucks and sometimes you just want to you know crush a six pack and go to sleep on a Tuesday um, because you know Private dick, fe- dick face got you know did something stupid in the motor pool and now everybody's in trouble. So I don't know. It's again, it's one of those. It's another one of those like some general came up with an idea because he does keto and he's like, look how great I look, and wouldn't we love every soldier to look like this? I don't know if when you were in, did they did the dining facilities have that like where they label everything with like red, yellow, and green? Like you know, uh, if it's you know. A food is red, like you should only eat very occasionally. Um, you know, I, I recall that towards the end of my time. Yeah, I mean, in the very beginning, no, but um, I think within the last couple of years that I was in, yeah, I do remember seeing it in some of the dining facilities in Korea, and I remember laughing because in in one case in particular, in one big office building I was in in Korea that had a uh, 
a dining facility, I remember there being like nothing. Everything was either red or yellow. Yeah. There were no green options at lunch. It's like, well, guess this is how it's going to be today. I guess I'm going to have <laughs> this, whatever this like fucking every, everything has pork in it. So I guess it's the Ray Conquista or something. Um, yeah, man, it's, it's, it's real stuff. Uh, I think the biggest thing too is just inst- implementing these things military wide. I think there was on the comment of the, of the, the soldiers getting, you know, recruited with huge bonuses. There was a comment from somebody that I thought that that made sense, which basically they're saying, do, when you talk about all this money, you know, at this level in the military, not like the, you know, gargantuan, disgusting defense budget, this kind of thing requires money from something. And so it's like, are you going to say, because I want infantry or special ops people to train even more, I'm willing to take money out of other things. I don't know. Same thing with this. A lot of the, the problems, in my opinion, um, for why people in the military are overweight. Um, I mean, a couple. I think, number one, it's very easy to, you know, to, to you have access to food that's not healthy. I mean, DFAC food can be healthy if you eat healthy, but it's not always easy. Also, a lot of times, soldiers don't have time to go to the DFAC because what you're doing all day, the time hacks you have all day don't don't allow it. And if you have, if there's no transit to get to the DFAC, you have to walk there. Soldiers don't all have cars, uh, you know, and there's going to be a long line and they don't have a lot of time to get in and get out. Chances are good that they're going to instead go to like McDonald's or Burger King on post, uh, or they're going to go to the shop at and they're just going to buy like, you know, a Jimmy Dean reheatable sandwich or something. Um, or they're just going to have a, a, a lunch of nothing but a can of Monster and some cigarettes. Uh, also, I think, you know, stuff like monsters and, you know, really sugary drinks are, are bad for you. I think that the access to that kind of food, I mean, I'm not saying you should ban them, but I'm just saying that, you know, you, you don't need to have them all the time. And, and I think that people who do don't realize just how much sugar and just how much caffeine and other stuff they're, they're taking in. Um, and then obviously I think the, 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 there's an extent to which people kind of go through these sort of boom and bust cycles in the sense that, you know, when you, you, when you're in the field and you're training, people tend to lose weight and they come back and, you know, they, they treat themselves. And as you get older, I think one of the things that isn't really addressed is that, you know, you, you might've had a, an impeccable metabolism at 22 or at 18, but you won't as you get older. I mean, I've seen this for myself, stuff that used to work for me for weight loss. Like if I gained weight after a while, I could cut weight really easily over the span of like a few weeks or a month. It doesn't work as well anymore. You know, I'm almost 35 and it's, it's not working the way it used to. And when it does happen, it takes a lot longer. Um, and then obviously, I think the thing you mentioned too is just alcohol. I mean, I think that, that I don't think people realize just how bad alcohol is for f- both both in terms of being empty calories you're consuming, but also in terms of the way in which it can negatively affect your metabolism. Um, and, you know, a lot of my experience in the army was that the military uh, both made a show of trying to get you to drink responsibly in terms of kind of covering their own ass or or creating plausible deniability, but then also either tacitly encouraged or at least tolerated a culture of extreme binge drinking. And it's been weird to me because living here in the UK, where obviously binge drinking is an even bigger problem, I see the way in which they kind of try to combat it. And one of the things that, that I've noticed is the way that alcohol is labeled in alcohol units, you realize that uh, if you if you base it on like the British guidelines, which is that you don't want to have more than it, they recommend not having more than seven units in a set in a drinking session and more than fourteen units per week. But unit doesn't equate to uh, you know what you might think. A can of beer might be a unit, but that might be more than that, based on the alcohol by volume. Um, you know, a, a bottle of wine might be anywhere, depending on the strength of the wine, from like nine to eleven units. Um, and, and so. If you go out and you have three pints, that's more than seven units already. Um, and when I think about soldiers drinking, like, you know, having like five, six shots before they go to the bar and then just like just, just, just crushing beers all night, like that's horrible for you. And, and you might get away with that when you're, you know, 21, 22, 23, but it's going to start to wear on you over time. Um, and then also the final thing I'd say is just like in terms of nutrition, I mean, they don't really teach you that much about it. Even in the special forces course, I remember it was crammed into like a all day nutrition session that just like, it was like nine to five PowerPoint. Like we were all basically worn out by the end. But I think one of the things they even admitted in that nutrition session was they struggle with getting the defects to serve the kind of food that they would, you know, we wouldn't have a problem getting people to serve for like elite athletes or college athletes because, you know, the defect 
is part of the DOD and whether it's a SOCOM DFAC or it's a, you know, you know, 420th laundry service company's DFAC, it's still run by the same uh, whatever organization, which is, you know, military funded, but may, I think it may be like a parallel government organization. Um, And they don't, you know, they're going to serve fucking chipped beef and biscuits every day for breakfast, which is biscuits and gravy, you know, like, that, I remember one of the instructors telling us there was legitimately like in the contract it was stated they would serve biscuits and gravy every day for breakfast that other things they could add subtract but they must at least serve biscuits and gravy and it's like imagine going up against that um, uh, uh, you know an army built on country fried southern food and you're trying to get people to, to do keto like how in the fuck is that going to work mm-hmm. yeah and and it won't and uh, I refuse to do it I will have Biscuits and gravy in the morning because, you know, I'm not normally What morning. a beautiful reward. What a beautiful reward biscuits and gravy is. When you have to get up for stupid army shit and you have to like either go straight to breakfast at 6 a.m. and train all day or like do PT and then go to breakfast. Like it is a wonderful reward to be able to like, oh, but I have this disgusting southern breakfast. Just like eggs and sausage and biscuits and gravy and just like fucking throw hot sauce all over it. Like it's amazing. Yeah. Like, look, for, for me in, you know, like at home. Um, for breakfast today because I'm going to, you know, I'm sitting here podcasting and then I'm going to sit at my computer for, for work. I have a very light breakfast, maybe a bowl of, of checks or whatever. But uh, if I'm in the army and I know that I'm going to have to be like doing shit all day, like, you know, not just like my battle assembly weekend, but like actually like, you know, going out into the field. Goddamn right. I'm going to have all that. Um, the difference, though, is that like, you know, for me, I'm 36 and now I'm conscientious about my weight. And so I wouldn't eat it all the time. But but yeah, man. I mean, like again, like I said, there's there, there's very few creature comforts to get in the army, and one of them is food. And you know, I I, I appreciate a salad bar, um, and I will partake in a salad bar um, if there is one that's out for like lunch and dinner. I will eat a salad, but also I will eat biscuits and gravy in the morning because fuck it. Even if the biscuits, even if those biscuits suck, which they always do. But I will eat them. Oh, they're never fucking, good. Yeah, those those fucking hard tack hexagon motherfuckers. Douse it in the gross ass gravy. I don't even fuck. I because I already know I'm going to hate myself, so I might as well go ahead and hate hate breakfast too. If you want my army hack for dining facilities, I figured this out in Afghanistan because obviously I was trying to eat healthy and eat more salads, but there wasn't really a lot to choose from as far as dressings go. Um, m- if my hack for having a salad as a meal was basically like to throw everything I liked on the salad. And then for dressing, I mean, this may not work if you're, um, if you don't like olives, but for me is get, throw some black olives on it, throw, if they have oil and vinegar, throw it on. If they don't have oil or vinegar, um, black olives, if you can get like the olive juice as well, and then throw, uh, get as mu- many lemon wedges as you can and just like put a lot of lemon juice on the salad and salt. And that that helped it be a little bit less of just like plain ass vegetables. But it was weird how that would happen where they have a salad bar, but like they didn't really pay much attention to what people might want on a salad because the expectation was like, no, you're going to eat fucking hoagies or whatever they're making, you know, hot wings, et cetera. Um, and uh, yeah, like you said, there's few c- creature comforts. I, I, I personally was a big fan of the old cigarette when I was in the army. You know, I was a pretty fast runner, but it didn't matter. I, I liked having my cigarettes. Uh, I don't smoke anymore. Uh, and I realize now that, you know, smoking's not good for you, but as you said, you're so often forced into like just dealing with whatever bullshit and you have zero control over that it is obviously nice when you can treat yourself. Um, I'll tell, tell you, as PAO, most of the stories that I found were uh, hanging out at the smoke pit. Um, just talking to people, go over there, start smoking a cigarette, talk to somebody. They're like, what do you do? Oh, you do that? That sounds fucking interesting. I'm going to come tell by. Tell me some stories about your unit. Like, what yeah, you've been I'm going to come by tomorrow and take pictures of you doing your job and uh, get a story out of it. And like that, yeah, most of like, I would at least 50% of everything that I've ever written, I got leads from, from, uh, from smoking. So, you know, who's to say if it's bad or good. <laughs> we can't tell. We can never tell. Uh, so the last thing we wanted to talk about today was an interesting story that I, that you, you sent me and that I thought was, um, was kind of indicative of a wider trend, which is the war has been going on so long that there are a number of things that have become kind of informal or unofficial traditions related to remembrance. And one of the things in particular is they they built uh, at Camp Pendleton, Marines have built crosses uh, that have become memorial sites to the soldiers or the Marines that they've served with who have died in, in combat. 
And so they call these things Horno Crosses, and, and it's related to the, the, the area at Camp Pendleton called Camp Horno. Um, but it's these crosses were built by volunteers, by Marines, uh, to, re- to commemorate fallen comrades in 2003. And over the years, these memorials have gotten bigger and bigger. And one of the things they've been talking about is that they're, they, the, the unit has been performing cleanup in these areas because people bring stuff in remembrance, you know, cans of beer, bottles of liquor and place them there. But at some point, it becomes such a massive agglomeration that they have to clean it up and get rid of it. And I think there's been some concerns about sort of the sensitivities of that because people get angry. Uh, but at the same time, it's like on a long enough timeline, it has to take place in the same way that, I mean, a graveyard, it makes sense to, to put grave put flowers on people's graves. But if you never clean up those flowers, then the graveyard becomes an enormous compost pile and it kind of defeats the purpose of it being orderly in any way. Uh, but I think the larger question here isn't that, obviously Camp Pendleton is going to have to do some sort of cleanup. That makes sense. Don't get me wrong. Um, but I think the other, the, the point is the extent to which so much of this stuff is is kind of informal because it kind of has to be in the sense that the war hasn't ended. There are no memorials to the GWAT. Like it's still going on, but that doesn't make those deaths any less acute in the lives of the you know the survivors. And so, I mean, I think about it. Uh, a friend of mine from my unit, while we were deployed, was working in the training room, and every night when he finished work he would go out and dig these post holes because he was building a climbing wall and he was a super outdoorsy guy and he knew how to do this. So he got the wood from the class four yard. He got concrete mix from the class four yard. He, he, he cemented the pylons in and he built a climbing wall. And uh, we talked about this and he decided he went to the, the, the people at the FOB and their wood shop made a sign in remembrance of uh, one of our officers who'd gotten killed as platoon leader named Brian Bradshaw. He was a friend of mine. I talked about it on the previous episode. And they named it after him. And then when um, when the climbing wall, when, when the FOB got turned over to the Afghans, I don't think they, they didn't bring it back. They probably brought the handholds back, but they did bring the sign back. And then they put the sign up in the, what they call Geronimo Gym, which is an old warehouse, warehouse facility in uh, Fort Richardson that got turned into you know, a great big open air gym. Or like oh, not open air, like outdoors, but rather just like a big open concept gym. And I think about that, that in a way, things like that are the only real official memorials in the sense, because in the same way that there was a monument on Fab Sharana to a soldier who had died from like the 173rd, but, or Disney Drive on Bagram is named after a specialist who was killed in a, uh, in a like a construction equipment accident in 2002. But they there isn't a place to do this like there isn't a national memorial yet and it seems weird to do it anyway if the the war is still ongoing and so instead you kind of have to like make it up as you go along if that makes sense uh and that to me is it, it's an interesting thing because in the absence of an actual memorial what do you do yeah and and it i think what it comes down to is you do whatever because you you know these guys aren't memorializing everybody they're not memorializing everybody who's lost their lives you know they're memorializing their people um you know the 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 people that they specifically have lost there's you know a memorial like that is you know even big ones like that become personal like and and I don't know I don't know about you know the Vietnam wall or or anything or if people have that that same like they they do pilgrimages to it but like you know a on a military base, having a like, oh, this is, you know, we're here, we're part, we're part of Camp Pendleton, and you know, I lost a buddy, and you know, I use this as, you know, part of my way of memorializing him, and you know, in in my own way, that my unofficial, unofficial way, uh, on this unofficial monument, and you know, I agree that they got to clean it up. Like, sorry guys, stop leaving your trash up there. Um, you know, any other military, you know, memorial doesn't look like garbage. Uh, and it's, it's just got to be done. Um, at the same time, I understand, you know, like you said, there, there has to be, there has to be a place. There has to be a place where you can mourn. Uh, and, you know, people need a physical place sometimes. They need a physical place to go to, to, to walk to, to make a pilgrimage, to, to make some sort of like, I, you know, it's not just, 
you know, here in my living room, I raise a, a, a can of beer, you know, because there's no, I don't, I don't want to say that there's not a challenge to it, you know, but like, it's the same reason why you go visit a friend's grapes, you know, gravestone. Um, because there is a, you know, you have to go and there's a physical location and there's a place that you feel like you have a connection and can talk to these people. So, you know, and, and which is why I'm sure that this memorial exists. And like we said, it's existed for most of the war at this point. Um, they're just saying, hey, we have to clean it up, which, you know, for which I would say, you know, hey, honor your buddies, but crack the beer open, pour out a little bit for your for your buddy and then drink the rest. Um, don't leave full cans of beer up there. That's that's a waste of time. That's a waste of a beer, really. Um, also, I was thinking to myself, like, imagine, I mean, what's the worst thing that could happen? I'm like, <laughs> I don't think Joe is above stealing bottles of liquor off the damn, the damn <laughs> fucking war memorial. I mean, you know, I'm just saying, I mean, like, <laughs> God, I feel like such an asshole saying this, but like, considering how many conversations... I have either witnessed or been a part of with regard to what the etiquette is about whether or not it's okay to hook up with the widow of your comrades who fucking died in combat. I do not think that people are above snatching fucking bottles of liquor off a goddamn monument. You know, it just depends on how long it's been up there because like if it's been a while since they've uh, cleaned it, who knows? Some of those bottles of Jim Bean could be like from 2008. And I don't know if, I don't know if uh, that's the kind of barrel aging that you're looking for. You know, sitting in in California heat uh, on a uh, underneath a cross, but I, you know, hey, um, Joe is a, a stupid fickle motherfucker. So um, I, I don't, I I also don't doubt that there might have been a little bit, a little bit of pilfering. But also, like I said, I, I've been like when my when my grandfather, you know, was was um, on his way out, as they say. Uh, we mentioned about coming and, you know, pouring a bottle of, uh, or pouring, you know, a shot of, um, Jameson cause he loved Irish whiskey on his grave. And he's just like, why would you fucking waste Jameson like that? Don't pour, I'm dead. Don't do that. Drink it. And then, you know, pass it through your kidneys if you want to give me something, but don't, uh, don't just pour a perfectly good whiskey on the ground just for me. So, um, but, but yeah, I, I mean, this is the thing. It's an informal, um, memorial. And the thing it, as a informal memorial, it is still there. And it's, uh, you know, it's a place where, where Marines can go and they can honor their friends who have, uh, who have died in the war, but also stop leaving your trash around there. Um, you go, like you said, uh, they have to clean up flowers on gravestones. You go to, um, you know, any military graves, uh, cemetery, uh, there's not a bunch of stuff just like pile. Like maybe there is for like a minute, like a day, and then they clean it up and then they get rid of that stuff because otherwise it starts to look kind of trashy and gross. And I don't know, maybe that's what they're going for. But I, I think overall, and this is, and you know, this is the opinion of two soldiers who, uh, who haven't visited this and haven't, you know, lost a Marine buddy uh in in combat you know the this so i don't know grain of salt what what the fuck we think i guess but uh, yeah i mean i also, I, I, I get it i i think it's it, it's also the question really becomes what do you do about informal memorials and i think that there's absolutely all perfectly good reasons to allow them and and, and let them you know propagate as they do but i also think that yeah, they, they have to clean stuff up in the same way that, you know, you have to, you know, you clean up any any memorial. I think it's it's a token of respect to do that. And, and and you giving, putting a bottle on someone's grave is no different than putting like a pebble on their grave or whatever you want to do. Um, but also uh, it's understood that it's going to get cleaned up. And I mean, the, it's the action of putting it there that matters to you or should matter to you at least. Yeah. Um, I've always been, but I don't know. I've always been a fan of the, you know, going going to the bar and buying a buddy a beer and, you know, writing, you know, the name or death date or whatever. Um, and knowing full well that, you know, if you're not drinking that beer, the bartender is going to dump it out. But like, it's just kind of like a momentary moment, um, memorial. Like I've always, you know, um, kind of appreciated that. I think that's a good way you know, to, to do it. Uh, but yeah, again, like I said, just, you can't, I'm, I'm all about an informal memorial, but like if I was trying to fucking slog my way through a bunch of fucking beer cans to honor my friends, I would be kind of fucking grossed out by it, I think. But, I don't know. but again, 
is all I can say is we're dads. It's a dad podcast, and you need to clean up your mess. Yeah, for real. Just stop fucking one. Stop wasting my beer like that, and two, clean up after yourself because that's how you get ants, and nobody fucking needs ants. Especially not in the middle of the California desert. Can you imagine? They might become super ants. Just imagine, like, you know, leaving other stuff out. Like, you start leaving out, like, oh, my buddy loved bratwurst and stuff. So you just start leaving out, like, like cooked meat and then just a bunch of coyotes start, like, descending on it and then start drinking the booze. And then you just have a bunch of drunk coyotes oh, no. out there and shit. Alcoholic coyotes. I mean, Jesus. But they might, they might at least show up to PT formation on time. <laughs> All right, everybody. Thank you so much. Uh, we should have uh, a lot of good bonus content coming out, so please feel free to uh, jump onto that Patreon. We're going to be getting the uh, the next zine put together. Uh, I've already got at least one piece. I'm working on my piece. Nate's working on a piece. Uh, this one is going to be uh, um, what what radicalized you. Whether uh, and like I said, you can be military, you can be civilian, whatever it is. Uh, you know, feel free to uh, to jump on in. We are we take submissions from everybody, so you can uh, either direct message me at Army Strang or direct message Nate at In These Deserts. You can also email the podcast at Sergeant Joker at Uh We have our YouTube, which uh, now that I'm no longer doing training and no longer dying, and have my house at a state where hopefully where it's going to be put on the market and get uh, snapped up fairly quickly, and then I no longer have to deal with this fucking nightmare. Any more uh, with luck, we'll uh, we'll, we'll have uh, a lot more content coming out, um, YouTube stuff coming out. Uh, looking forward to doing uh, to, to opening up stores, doing more with Teespring, more with designs. We got a lot going on. It has been a summer. It has been a bit of a summer for I think both uh, Nate and I because me um, trying to get this house ready for market and uh, Nate. I know you've been. Your, your your shit has been expanding and uh, you've been doing a lot more. So, but I think uh, we should be coming up on an even keel pretty soon. So, patreon.com slash hell of a way to die. That's where you can find us. $5 a month gets you access to everything, $10 gets you our zine, physical zine sent to you. Um, I will have, by the time this comes out, go to the Patreon page. This is the, the digital version of the last zine will be out. I apologize for not getting that out earlier. It is, again, like I said, it's been a bit of a summer. So, uh, But that's going to be out there. That's going to be for everybody who's a Patreon, uh, $1 and up. Uh, you'll be able to download that PDF and, uh, and take a look at it. So, uh, But other than that, thank you all. Uh, thank you for being members. Uh, thank you for being listeners. Please rate us on, uh, on iTunes. Get us, uh, subscribe to us on YouTube, uh, all of that great stuff. And we will talk to you next week. Zoom.